What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of AWeber, Zapier, P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, This episode is brought to you by Rise25. Dot com, which I co-founded with my business partner, Jen Corcoran. At Rise25, we host in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country. Um, we've hosted them in this past year and a half, San Diego, Santa Barbara, Chicago, Sonoma, Vegas, San Francisco, probably more I'm missing. Uh, we also are a complete done-for-you solution to help someone launch and run their podcast or content. So you just show up, you talk, and we do everything else. I am very excited. Uh, today we have Travis Rosser, co-founder of Kajabi, who has sold his stake in it, and he's doing some other really interesting things that everyone should know about. Travis worked in the software space in corporate America for over 10 years, and he realized he wasn't cut out for the cubicle world. So he looked for another opportunity and discovered the educational tech space, and uh, He started developing at night while working a full-time job. I love to hear those stories, Travis. And they launched the beta in early 2010. To date, over 10,000 customers have used Kajabi software. They went from bootstrapped to making multiple millions each year. He is the author of the book, You Inc., the step-by-step guide for finding a business within you. And you've helped many, tens of thousands of people help yeah. find their business within them. Um, so there's so much to talk about, Travis. And I was chatting with Bradley Will, who I love, who you're friends with. Yeah. And he That's remembers great. visiting your office when there was a taped up sign on the door. <laughs> yes. yes. Tell me exactly. what was life like? What was Kajabi like then? Well, thank you, first of all, for having me on the show. Uh, great introduction. Uh, this is so cool to be on on here. Bradley comes to our very first office. And back then, this is in – we opened in 2010. Bradley might have came in 2011 because we it was in the fall of 20, uh, 2010. And it was an old – like loft in this in the city of Tustin, they called the district Old Town Tustin. We had gone down there because we saw some office space available, and then as we're looking for this office space, we see in the alley this like upstairs thing that was in this old building, and so right away we had we had leased that space, and um, yeah, it had like a sticky note on the door in handwriting that said Kajabi. <laughs> just so you would. He know wishes you he there. took a picture of that. I remember he's like, I wish I would have just taken a picture of that. I think I have you. a video somewhere because I would do tours of the office because I was so proud of it. It was so cool looking inside. It was old. It looked like a Starbucks inside. And we only had half of of the floor. They had built a wall right down the middle. So you walked in and it, it felt like half of a floor. <laughs> like it was just half of a loft. And then as we grew, we actually um, got a longer lease and we tore down the wall and made the office bigger, and we were there for like three years. It was great. It had its own balcony, um, and it was just this old building that I I love. I would love to be back in that building one day <laughs> in some capacity because it had great energy, and every time you walked in the door, it just felt awesome. Travis, I want to hear about in a second about the transition um, because you're working full time, and, and this is also what your book, You Inc., does. Uh, right. which is a step-by-step guide to helping people find the business within you. At the time, you're working full-time. So talk right. about the decision and the point where you decide, okay, I'm, you know, I don't know if it seemed like a leap at the time, but it may, yeah. a lot of times it does. It's a little bit scary probably. Yeah. You know, I'd been searching for a long time for the thing I was supposed to do. Like I had been building software, building websites, working in in cubicles forever. I'd done lots of consulting. I had even tried to work from home on and off. But at that time, I was back in corporate America. And and I talk a lot about this in the book. But the short version is I saw this opportunity uh, with my friend Kenny, who co-founded the company with me. And um, we just – we had started networking with key people in the information marketing space. And we started working on the app because we knew we had a chance. We had the first customer, Annie Jenkins, was going to use it. 
And I read the book Crush It at that time, which I still love that book today. And I love during it that too, time, yeah. it's the best. Gary V is on YouTube back then doing that speech where he's like, Man, if you really want to make it, you gotta you gotta quit F and watching Lost. And and at that time I was watching Lost all the time. <laughs> it was like a thing in like two thousand nine. And and so literally I was like, Man, we gotta make this happen. And so we were just committed that I would work all day at my normal job come home at like six o'clock in the evening, um, spend some time with my kids and then at eight o'clock at night, just get to work. And sometimes we would work all night long and then get up and go back to work. And I did that for about four months, just making sure everything was ready so that when we launched it, um, it was ready to cash flow. Cause I didn't want to jump from, I had a very nice six figure job being a web design manager within a search engine company. And it was easy pay, easy job. So I didn't want to jump and just hope. I, I wanted to make sure everything was moving and the company had made money before I jumped. So how did that? The how did you get your first initial customers? So what we did back then was I had been watching some of the key people on Twitter back then in 2009. Guys like Frank Kern and Andy Jenkins. These are guys that were selling information and really had it figured out way back then. And so through Twitter, I just reached out to them. And if they had a question about design or a blog, I would answer. And eventually I got on the phone with Andy Jenkins. I'm like, oh, dude, I can fix your blog. I can design it. And we we did that. I helped him. I was able to get a meeting with him. And I was like, hey, we have this idea of like, what if you could take all the stuff you buy on DVDs to learn something and put it all online with the shopping cart, with the squeeze page. And he was like, that's a great idea. So he was the first customer, hmm. first course. He launched February of 2010 and literally made a million dollars within a day or so. And that was like mind blowing because I had heard about that. We'd all heard the rumors about that on the internet. But then to see the transactions going through, I was like, holy crap, this is real. And so that was it. And then we just kept marketing to key people for free, completely for free, making no money at all at that point. And by them hitting home runs, you know, I always say it's like Tiger Woods winning the Masters with our golf clubs. Everybody wanted it after that. So mm. anytime you can do that in a business, try to find key people. I, I call it marketing to the front row and give them white glove experience with your knowledge or your expertise. Do not try to pay them or get paid from them. Do it for the hustle for free. It's very common now. You have influencers on social media now. And they do this all the time. Like, Oh, I just bought this great book, uh, you ink, you know, and then but it's the same thing. It's like they used our software. And so they would talk about it. Like you got to check out this Kajabi thing and it created crazy buzz. So there's two things I want to unpack. One, the evolution of the product and then the evolution of charging. So yes. what was the first version of Kajabi like? I'm sure it's different now than it was. Oh yeah. I mean, so before it was available in October, 2010, that version that those first customers use had no admin interface, meaning if you wanted to make a change, our programmers had to change the code and change it through the database. So it was very custom. So we almost made the first version. I don't want to say on smoke and mirrors, but it worked, but a customer couldn't edit it yet. Yeah. We didn't go to it's market. It's not like a do it yourself type of thing. At not that point. yet. Yeah. No, it took six more months before that was ready. And that was pretty smart because then we got all the, the end user features dialed in. Instead of building the whole thing and then going, okay, what do you guys think? We were able to build a pretty strong demo for these guys that they could deliver because on, on the customer end, it was really solid. But on the admin end, we had to figure out how to make that simple. And the first version comes out in October 2010. And because of the pent-up demand, thousands of people start using it right away which was overwhelming as an entrepreneur because I had only worked on small teams or I had consulted for one or two clients. But then to have thousands of people using your app, it was like I learned a lot about anxiety during that time. <laughs> thought I had a heart attack two different times, but it was just anxiety. <laughs> How was the um, – it sounds like the idea hasn't changed. Like what it is now and what it started off isn't that much different. No, what it is, is I didn't realize at that time that we were uncovering a movement, like this movement of your knowledge and sharing your knowledge. That's what we launched this on. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard the story, but the way we came up with the concept was 
that summer of 2009, Kenny and I were trying everything we could to make money online. We were building apps. We built a game on Twitter, a scavenger hunt game called Find That Tweet. We did all kinds of things. And one of the things we did is he had built this car wash for his kids out of PVC pipes and sprinklers. And it was really cool. And so I built one too. And my kids would use it with their bikes. They'd drive down. And we're like, let's sell these on the internet. And after thinking about it, I was like, I'm thinking that's a lot of work. Because I'm a, I'm a hustler, but I'm also a lazy entrepreneur. Like I like to leverage my time really well and get good return. And we're like, what if we shoot videos and show people how to do this? Because we had seen that before and we're like all right let's use wordpress let's use all the plugins at the time we use clickbank for the sh- click yeah clickbank for the shopping cart and it was hard like it w- we were we were 10 years in the space we were trying and to patch crazy. together a bunch yeah, of different things duct taping all kinds of stuff and it was hard like he, here he is kenny's a really good program i'm an incredible user interface designer and we couldn't get it to work after maybe a week we did get it to work and it made a couple hundred bucks and we're like, well, what if there was an easier way to do what we just did? And that was when the seed was planted and it wasn't for three more months until we realized that this was going to become a thing. And it wasn't until after we launched in that December of 2010, we did a survey like, what are you guys doing on Kajabi? What's going on? And when we started getting the results back of what people were teaching and how they, successful they were becoming, that's when it blew our mind. We're like, this is like a thing. This is like a, it's obviously a platform, but it's a, it's a new opportunity that the average person has. It was very disruptive at that time because it was very hard to do it yourself. You had to have programmers and merchant accounts and shopping carts. And now it was like, all you needed was your iPhone. What was causing you the anxiety? You would think uh, like it, floods of customers would make you. Oh yeah. The, 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 money, part was great. Yeah. <laughs> the money part was great. But with that comes a lot of responsibility because you need to deliver on every level that they're paying you for. And back then, we had a support team in the Philippines, and they were ready. We had trained them. And so we launched on a Thursday. We didn't realize, because we were very new at offshore teams, that they were a full day ahead of us. So Thursday was Friday, and then Friday was Saturday. So by the time our Saturday came, they now had been off for a full day. So the tickets were piled up, and we didn't notice And so Kenny and I are at our, I'm at my kid's soccer game. He's over at his kid's soccer game. And he, he texts me. He's like, dude, we have a problem. We have like a thousand trouble tickets. I'm like, (laughs) and they were simple. They were like, Hey, what's my password? Or how do I tweak this image? Just normal questions. But our team hadn't touched it. And so that day we went and got all of our Macs and like put them on his kitchen table and like, just, you know, circled the wagons. Like, Hey, we'll get back to you. Or here's how you fix it. And I think that was the awakening of the amount of pressure that we had just created for ourselves. We weren't, we didn't prepare for that. Mm. Like I, you can't, even though I love it now and I would not change it for the world. But I used to say that I left my comfort zone on another continent. Like it's, it's so far away. I don't remember it anymore. And sometimes you're like, am I really ready for this? And now I'm so grateful. I mean, I would do it again and again and again, because it was awesome. So what point did you decide to leave the full-time job? Probably two years two years ago, I realized that the entrepreneur I was probably wasn't helping as much because I'm much more of a startup storyteller guy. And I went through this whole thing where I started interviewing the Kajabi, what we call Kajabi heroes, someone that makes over $1,000. Because once you make 1000 bucks, you're on the journey to be an online entrepreneur. It's, it's like it's concrete in your soul now. So I would interview these people and these moments would happen where they would tell stories just like we're doing right now on video and we both would get goosebumps because it was powerful. They would say how they had become a millionaire or how it changed their family's lives or their customers' lives. And I didn't know back then, but that's when the opportunity for me, that seed was being planted. And so for a year or two, I just tried to figure out how can I help, what can I do? And the company is now growing my job, probably three people do my job at that point. There's designers, there's product people, there's all kinds of people. And I'm like, what can I do? And so I I sat down to start writing the book last October. And through that process of writing the book, I just realized maybe it's time to go beyond uh, the influence of Kajabi and take this message everywhere. You know, let let Kenny do what he wants to do, run it the way you want to run it. And I'm going to just sell my stake, move on and take this anywhere I can because I really – 
now that I'm out, I am completely unbiased. I don't care what you use. I don't care if you do like knowledge entrepreneurship person to person. I just want people to realize they have knowledge inside of them and it can become a business and it can free them from the cubicle world that I was freed from. And I just have such like passion for sharing that now. So talk about the evolution of charging. Okay. When you started with those influencers. Yeah, we always knew we had to charge. We did not want to do freemiums, like uh, the whole concept of try it for free. I always thought about it like, hey, have a steak dinner and then pay me later. Well, that's, man, you're really messing with someone's. Yeah. Yeah, we have real cost, and and I want you to pay so you appreciate it. So those first customers were completely free, and some of them stayed free the whole time because that was – they're like our professional athletes. You know, We're willing to do it, and some of them eventually we were paid as affiliates. So like we started building a pretty good email list because we were at the bottom of all of their sales pages. And it's powered by Kajabi. So, you know, tens of thousands of people are signing up. So after one or two of those, we would say, hey, sign up for Frank Kern's course, which I fully believe in Frank. I love his stuff. So we would say, go get the stuff and we'll give you a free year of Kajabi. And so then we would get the commission from from Frank and those people. And that helped us fund the company at the beginning. And then we always knew we were going towards a launch date where someone would pay us a monthly fee. We had thought about should we do the percentage of you know profit but really I, I wanted to be like just this fee you pay and then the possibilities are un, you know unlimited on your end and that's where we're always heading we, we even tried free trials at one point did not work at all mm-hmm. so we we moved to free enter your credit card maybe like a dollar trial or we won't charge your card for like 30 days if you're running the subscription model I highly recommend you you do that Make sure you capture their credit card and provide crazy value. Give them the full version of the app so they love it. And then have systems in place and follow-ups to get them successful as soon as possible. Because back then we would analyze what made someone stick. And we we learned Mm. if they posted a video, that helped. If they made a sales page, that helped. And then we learned if they made $1,000, they never left. And so that became like the benchmark and we kind of – reverse engineered all the steps we saw people taking, which eventually led to like the book. Like that's the whole purpose. The book takes 20 customer stories, tells their story, breaks down the entire scope of someone's knowledge that you have in life and shows you how to turn it into a business. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I want to talk about what's in the book a little bit. Um, people can get on Amazon, any other places they should check it out. Amazon, I'm always on social media. So on, on Facebook, I'm Travis Rosser fan. And on Instagram, I'm Travis Rosser. I'm on there all the time. You can always see what I'm doing because I talk about the book a lot. I'm doing things like workshops coming up this next year where I'll spend a day with you and we'll go through the book and we'll help you hmm. kind of organize your knowledge. So new stuff always happening. So Travis, um, I know you have a lot of favorites. What's a favorite story from the book if you had to choose one? I think... There's, there are so many. That's why they're in the book. Yeah. One of the one of the best ones, um, one of the most unique ones that I saw that really made me realize we made something really cool was Keith. Um, if you search how to start a landscaping business on YouTube, you'll find all of Keith's videos. Like he is the expert in teaching you how to start a landscaping business. And for me, that hit home because that was one of my first entrepreneurial endeavors was mowing people's lawns. Mm. And here is a guy now on my platform. And he makes multiple six figures teaching how to start a landscaping business now. And his story is awesome. And like when I interviewed him, I just I felt so much energy from him. And I was like, my story came full circle. Like that's something that blew my mind is here's a guy that's doing what I did my first job. But now he's doing it on the platform I'm built. And he's on his way to become potentially a millionaire one day from it. And he's helping other people start businesses like his stories are awesome. He even has a story of one time someone contacted him and said, Keith, man, I was watching YouTube late at night. My, my job sucked. My life sucked. I was getting ready to end it all. And then I saw your videos hmm. and I, I was like, look, who's this crazy guy? Like, and, and it gave me hope and I started investigating and I started doing the things you said. And I was like, that's what this is all about. Like those kind of stories. And you would have never thought that would, that, that's what would come out of his landscaping videos. You never, 
you never would think that a guy talking about landscaping in his truck shooting these crazy videos would affect someone's life that way but every time we share our story and, and we like help someone that is the result is we encourage them in some way and to me that's the number one reason why I'd, i do this is i know it's going to help someone and it's pretty powerful when i meet those people like lately i've been at events talking about my book and people will come up and say Travis, I'm a Kajabi customer and I became a millionaire on Kajabi. Hmm. That's insane because I remember being in my cubicle and thinking, what could I do one day to become a millionaire myself? And then here's this person, like I did this and and and, and that that was just surreal. Like that that was the, the thing about writing the book was me finally taking ownership of that because for years I just had my head down. I was working. I didn't even notice what what we had built. So what made people stick on the platform? Because I think the reason I ask is it's the same thing that will make them stick and follow through with your advice. That's right? right. Here's the thing. Everybody in this business struggles with the next shiny object. Like that is, that's a big deal. Um, we found though that if they could make money on our system, um, they would stay loyal to the system. And, and that was, that was completely true. As soon as we can get them successful, um, that was the main thing. And I know that when I was there, I was very connected with the customer cause I was emotionally involved in their journey. Like I wanted to see them succeed. So I know that some of the stickability there was knowing that we wanted them to win. I mean, the whole concept of the hero, I mean, you have to remember that you're not the hero. Like I am not the hero of these stories. I'm telling them they're the heroes. I'm just the guide. I'm just a guy that understands how to get there and what they did. And now that I'm out here promoting my own book, I'm on my own journey now. And I can talk from real world experience of how to, like my book became bestseller on Amazon in multiple categories. I can talk about that and guide someone else to that. And I think when you build a product or a service, don't try to be the hero. Like they'll get turned off right away. But if you can allow them to trust you and be authentic and have real results that you can guide them to, Man, they're going to be fans forever. So, yeah, because I always hear these stats of people who buy books. I don't know what's true, what's not. Ninety percent of them never open it. What do you think the percentage yes. is of people who, on a platform, whether it's Kajabi or something else, get an account? Because there's something about getting an account that like satisfies something inside you, and I yeah. imagine that's why people never use it. Yes. What do you think that percentage is? Because buying a book and buying an app and subscribing is an action step. And so your subconscious will screw with you. You're like, oh, dude, you bought the book. I don't know the exact percentage, but I know there was times we would run reports all the time, like who has never logged in. And years and years ago, that number resulted in 70 grand of subscriptions that came to Kajabi of people that never logged in, wow. ever. And I'm like, this is nuts. And so that's why we, we continue to try to find ways to stimulate them to move because every person I interviewed, every time I, they're like, what advice would you give? And they're like, I should have moved sooner. I should have gone sooner. That's the, all the advice. They didn't talk about mistakes or how they screwed up or price too low or nobody bought. It was, I should have went sooner. And, mm. and I think that that is the number one, number one thing is is as a customer you need to move sooner, but as a person that just wrote a book, I thought about this a lot because I thought about the books I read and liked. Hmm. And as I was writing the book, especially as I first finished it, the first version, I didn't like it. I was like, I don't want to be someone who just says I wrote a book. Like I want this book to make an impact. So if you have a product or service, you better believe in it and it better deliver what you say. And then you don't need to worry about results as much because the person that actually takes action and reads the book or logs into the app will find success and that that percentage will always be better than someone that logs in once and goes this is stupid and then just cancels you know i see a lot of people um you know you want to help them find the business within them and i'm sure there's there's also like self-talk that goes on and them thinking well i don't have anything to share and yes um so i'm curious how you help people get over that and then I also want to hear about the strangest educational course you've seen someone create because I think that may put some yeah, things sure. in perspective of, look, this person created this crazy thing that actually worked. You probably yes. have something that's not as crazy as that that would work. So Yeah, so 
he, here's what I have is in the book I broke down every single customer into four like categories of knowledge mm-hmm. and I call them the four P's. They're super easy to like remember and think about, but it's going to be hard for you to realize that you're an expert in some of these. The first one is is profession. So that is like job, anything you've ever been paid for. So like I have examples of John who has the Excel Academy that was worked in an analytical company and he was really good at making the formulas in Excel. He starts blogging about it and then people want to buy his formulas. Then he puts it online and now years later he makes multiple hundreds of thousands a year and he does not work in a cubicle anymore. This is all he does. So I think there's things at your job that you take for granted totally. and you re- you don't realize you're really good at these. That's the first one. The next one is passion. And that's the stuff you do for fun. It's the stuff you pay money to do. Like my kids play ice hockey and those coaches have a huge passion and a lot of them monetize it because they're good at sharing their knowledge. But what are you good at that you love and you're like crazy obsessed about, you're probably watching YouTube videos on this all the time, which for my kids, it's video games or my, my younger son, it's like every highlight of every NHL game or like maybe it's drones or maybe it's, there's so many things that are passion driven. And it's not just the obvious ones of golf and surfing and yoga. It's like, it's like the fun stuff. Like here's the first crazy one I'll give you is the lady teaches horse ballet. I never horse even heard ballet. of horse, horse ballet. Yeah. And it has some cool like Russian name, but that's not the English way to translate <laughs> it. Is it's rush it's a horse ballet and she makes money teaching that and that's her passion. And that's what I'm talking about is there are things we do that are fun. And I talk about it in the book is if there's if there's people that are interested in it, if there's a product you know you could make and you know they'd pay you money, then you're on to something. And I show people how to research that and figure that out. Hmm. Um, the next one is 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 problems like problems that you have like i believe that if we are given a problem in life whether it's from god or whatever you believe and you overcome it you have an opportunity to share that with other people and help them and a lot of people have turned this into businesses and some people are like well i just like to volunteer and i but you you don't understand when you're getting paid to do something help people you have more reach you can help more people. Totally. Um, you're going to feel a new a new passion and purpose because you're getting paid to help people, and that is just a powerful opportunity. Yeah. You're also able to help people that could never afford. Like my own wife is good at, at repairing credit. Like she she's just so good at this. And I always tell her, like, you got to help people that are pretty high end that are trying to get a house, get pay, and then give away free training for students and people that can't afford it like that's why you want to make sure you find a group that'll pay you so that you truly can help people for free if you go the other way around help for free and try to get donations you'll burn out you'll burn out and you don't have as much control over how you do it and the last one is see i did problems pain pain is the next one something that hurts problems and pain are very similar but pain is something devastating, a death, a divorce, um, things you just don't know you're going to overcome. And there's people that have, have been able to turn that into their passion, their business. And that's kind of where I get, where I go is start there. And yeah. here's the thing. I, I called it you Inc because you are an expert at being you. That's, that's the thing that people will say, well, who's going to buy from me? Well, nobody's going to buy from, from me. It, it's, it's the you, it's the person that you see in the mirror. It's, it's the person you're going to help. There's thousands of people that will resonate with your message, your voice, how you look. Even if you don't like how you look in the mirror, there are people that will look at you and go, like, I trust that guy. I trust that. I trust that woman. I am going to listen to her. And you just got to go for it. Yeah. So if someone could teach people how to do horse ballet or horses, then you, you can take one of your passions. What's another crazy one that comes to mind? Okay, another crazy one, and this was nuts because I thought this was fake, but then I, I eventually, I think I met the guy. It was a guy that was helping his girlfriend, and she was a stripper, and she created a course called Strip and Grow Rich, and it was about how, how to manage your When Napoleon Hill stripper. came out with Thinking Grow Rich, yeah. I'm sure that's not what he had in mind. And, and they were teaching the business aspects of being an entertainer, like the money and how to manage your money and how to dress and how to act, and I was like – this is so odd, but it's kind of clever. Like that's kind of what it's about is 
at your job, what are you really good at? Like, I think back to the jobs I had, and I'm going to do a video on this later. I'm going to go through every single job and identify the things that could have been businesses. One was I was a Domino's pizza driver. I could have done a small course on how to optimize getting tips. And everything I learned and interview other drivers, like that has value. I worked at a pumpkin farm. And at that time, I built their first haunted hayride. And I could have monetized a course on how to build a hayride and make money from it. Like that's the stuff I'm talking about, especially if you can tie this thing to making money when it comes to profession or getting a better job or, I mean, think about it. People pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to school and get a job. Why wouldn't they pay you? A thousand dollars or five hundred dollars to get that job. You, I mean, you've seen so much in the online education space. I'm curious, and you have you have two kids too. I'm curious. Do you think this will end up disrupting college or higher education, or you think it's too ingrained? Um, I think it is. Even if Kajabi didn't exist and I didn't write the book, it would just because of YouTube and everything. Mm -hmm. Because we live in this world where if you don't know something, what's the first thing you do? You, You Google it or you watch a YouTube video. And so this already happened in our society. I just happened to be building Kajabi during the middle of it and seeing it because, you know, first there was information and lots of it. And then eventually that information was organized in like kind of Yahoo had directories and then Google really perfected it finding. And then YouTube put a face on it. And then pretty soon those faces became real people and we started connecting with them. And that's when it wasn't just information, it was knowledge. And I believe that knowledge is your biggest asset. I call it knowledge capital. It's the thing you have based on all your life experiences because there's two groups that right now in society are trying to figure out what's next. And it's the older group that's like, oh, crap, that 401k didn't work out. It was a total lie. But your real 401k is all of your knowledge. You have all this amazing knowledge. Then you have the other group that's the millennials. And I have an office at WeWork, so I have all these awesome friends that are in their 20s, and they're awesome. Like They're ready for this new workforce. That's what's going to be disrupted is all of the cubicles. Because the the new workforce doesn't need a cubicle. They don't need the rules. They don't need anything. Technology flows from them. They understand this. So one of the books I want to write is is U Inc for seniors and U Inc for students. And I'm going to talk about because I have I have people I've met where a younger person helped an older person. And they created a business together. Like that can be happening right now. And that that's more disruptive than just school. The thing that I think is is really devastating about school is how we we are teaching everybody how to get in debt. Like, not only do you get a diploma, but you get a giant debt. It's expensive. Yeah, it's expensive, and it's not really built for careers. We never hired anybody at Kajabi that, based on their college education, at least half of them didn't finish college because they started doing this. They learned on YouTube. They started programming. They started teaching themselves. Like one of the things I always say is you, why are you? Are, you are the next you. You are the next university. Hmm. And the way you handle your life is how you get ready for a job. Well, I look forward to seeing your son as a director someday. In I movies. know. Um, we have to give a shout out. Where should people subscribe to the YouTube channel? Oh, his? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Limitless Cinemas is Kyle, my son's. Um, he makes these really cool little YouTube trailers. He hardly ever posts. But if you want to see a 15-year-old kid just starting from scratch, he's been doing it since he was 11. He's going to kill me that this is on here because he's very like specific. He's very creative and specific. <laughs> but totally yeah, cool. that, that's the future right there is trying yeah. things. Just doing it, yeah. Um, yeah. Travis, two last questions, and thank you for your time. Everyone should check out You, Inc., the step-by-step guide for finding a business within you. Whether you have a business or you're thinking about a business, it's going to help you. I mean, just those four steps alone can help you. You know, we're always iterating on our current business. So thanks for sharing that. Um, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, one, what's been a low moment that you had to push through? And two, what's been a high moment that you're especially proud of? Yeah, I mean, there's been different seasons in my life that, that have gotten low. Uh, the first one I ever experienced was as a kid. I stuttered really bad from like, I don't even know, seven maybe till 18, 19. Yeah, and I've heard you talk low. about this, yeah. Yeah, I, it was a low time for me because it was childhood and, and there was fun things about it, and, but it was difficult because I couldn't talk and, and I was terrible in school. And that was definitely a low time. Um, there's no doubt about I mean, that. people um, are self-conscious about their shoes, right? Or yeah, something yeah. they're wearing, it, let alone stuttering, <laughs> right? 
Yeah. How I've do you how now. do you handle that? How do you deal with that at the time? Well, well, back then I didn't know any better. So how I handled it was we had a farm and I came home every day from school and I went outside with my dog and just walked around the farm and built things and dreamed and prayed to God all the time. Like, God, one day I don't want to stutter. One day I want to do this. One day I want to figure out how to make money because I would hear my parents complain about money all the time. And I think that's part of it is stay – when you're down and you can't move, then dream about where you want to go because – that's half of all of this is continuing to dream. That's why I love that Kyle's making those movies. Who cares if they're the way they are now or if it's impossible? As long as he's dreaming, he's heading somewhere. I mean, that's, and he's acting on the dream. He's acting on the dream exactly. And that, that's that's the other like the other low time was probably being in those cubicles and realizing, wait, this is life. Like, this is it. I have to sit in traffic all day to sit in this box all day and build these things that I don't always get credit for and nobody really cares. And I think that was another low point. And I think I like the Steve Jobs thing. Every time you're not enjoying something, you know, for so many days in a row, make a change, pivot. Like Mm. I do that now. Now that I have more resources and freedom, if I'm not really enjoying it and it doesn't really give me power in my life, like that positive feeling inside, I I move on (laughs) for sure. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, are there any influential books that you have? Like when you're going through that, sometimes I think there's maybe not a lot of hope always. Yeah. Right. And you yeah. almost need to see it to believe it. And sometimes when you, even when you see yeah. it from a distance, it's not believable. That's right. Well, I think reading is huge. Um, I became a subscriber to audible way back when it came out, like the first year you could get five books a month. And that year I read 60 books. I followed that all year cool. long and I don't do that anymore. It's impossible. <laughs> I'm like way behind, but that's important. Find books you like. I mean, I like all the ones that are always talked about. Rich dad, poor dad was a huge one because I grew up with a poor dad and it just made me change my mindset. That's why books are huge is you need to change the way you think because if you want to be something you're not right now, you have to start with your mind. You have to, and you can do it while you're driving, while you're stuck in traffic. I mean, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, obviously. Four-hour work week was incredible because it made me stop thinking about paychecks, and that's not the way to go. Um, and then, obviously, Think and Grow Rich is huge because Napoleon Hill interviews all these greats from the beginning of our country, the beginning of capitalism really becoming something big. And the key there is – you know. You think of an idea, you believe you can do it, and then you do it. And and I'd always been a thinker, always, but I hadn't learned the believe part because I know now that is where the magic is. Because once you fully believe, and it, it sounds so corny, but it is so true because once you believe at that level, you're fully committed, and you'll do whatever it takes. You'll pivot. You'll talk to anybody. Yeah. You'll max out your credit cards. You'll do whatever it takes to get that idea once you fully believe in it. Yeah, totally. So, I think and he's, I also, it's like what like you see and believe you can achieve or something. That one of his his quotes, yes. Right. And then I would say I love my book too. <laughs> just well, so is yours going to be on Audible? You Inc. Yes, it is. Okay, I'm, good. I'm in the process of doing some studio time good. and doing that. that well, process let me cause know because we'll push it out. I am a huge Audible, avid Audible person, so I know myself yeah. and I will listen to it. And I don't read as much. Well, you, but I, you know, there's something I did is because I'm not a reader either. So it's a short book and it, it's a quick read. I mean, it's not like a super thin book, but but it is like it's it's crush it size. Yeah. And it's really it's meant to be read in, in a weekend because I want you to kind of flow through it and just get inspired. And at the end, it really takes you through some steps that you're like, well, I could do that. I could do that this weekend. So totally. So last is a proud moment. What's been I mean, the over the long journey, but a longer one to come. What's been a proud moment? One of the most recent proud moments besides having, having kids and um, getting remarried to my awesome wife. That has been incredible. But just when that book came out, that was pretty crazy. I, I remember I was shooting a course and there was a video crew and my wife walks in and it was the first copy of the book. It was like in this sealed FedEx thing. And that was a moment I got emotional and the cameras were there. So it's all on film of me just opening it and being like, this is real. That was, that was a really, and it's not that it's just proud. It's just like, I did this, like I accomplished this. And then when it went live and and I saw it finally hitting some categories as bestseller, I was like, this is crazy. 
I think my most proud moments have been surreal moments in the moment. And it's not until I look back when I'm like, whoa, that was, that was incredible. Yeah. So. Travis, I mean, what I see from listening to you, all the research I did is you seem to be one, you're always of service. And even from Kajabi, like you want to be of service, help people. You achieve your dreams, but help other people do it as well. You're doing it with the book. I remember I watched like a 20 minute video of you in Rwanda going and helping these kids. Um, yeah. So I just appreciate you being of service to everyone and everyone should check out you Inc. And I'm looking forward to it coming up on, on Audible. Where... Yeah should we point people towards online uh, to go yeah, I mean, in general? Yeah, I mean, I have travisrosser.com. Everything points to my book right now, but I'm working on the blog. I'm also working on podcasts because I love that you help people do podcasts. You do that. Yes. Podcasts are the best. So definitely youinkbook.com will continue to have more information. And then social media, just my name, Travis Rosser, yeah. both Instagram or on Facebook. It's like Travis Rosser fan or something like that. So cool. And connect. I like literally talk to everybody because – I don't have that big a following. I, I built Kajabi for years. My, my social media following is pretty small. So if you follow me now, I'll actually get to know you. <laughs> <laughs> follow him now before, uh, before, before it blows it's, up. Before it's exactly. too big and I can't find your message. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. I want to be the first one to thank you, Travis. It's an absolute sure. pleasure. Everyone check out you, Inc. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand.